guys. Uh, welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Te- uh, Plant Medicine, Cannabis, Psychedelics, and Pharmaceutics with Dr. Ho. I'm so excited about today. I have a guest with me today, so you guys are going to learn a lot. So glad to have nurse practitioner Julie Butler with us. But before we get to that part of this show, you guys know we have to do our good house cleaning. So what is our good house cleaning? This show is for educational purpose and should not be taken as medical advice. Please consult with your doctor for all your medical needs. Do not start or stop any medicine without talking to your doctor. Having said that, uh, what is our next uh, on the agenda? What is our next house cleaning? Without our sponsor, we just cannot even bring this show to you. We are very appreciative of all these folks supporting us. And one of those folks is WCI Health, uh, they are Alternative Health and Wellness uh, Hub, and they are also the uh, manufacturers of Glow's Beauty products. So for all your hemp derived CBD product, head straight to their website, wci-health.com. And of course, uh, you are sponsors, uh, our Patreon sponsors, our Apple subscriber, and of course, those of you that are on our, our Healthy Course Well membership, I really want to say thank you so much uh, for what you are doing to support us. And for those of you that are still uh, brewing, still thinking of, uh, uh, should I join, should I not join, please come on, join us. Without you, we are not going to be able to bring this show to you. And finally, for those of you that are wondering, who the heck is this lady? You are new to this platform. Welcome to our tribe. Welcome to our village. I normally tell you guys it takes a village. So who am I? I'm Dr. Lola, also known as Dr. O. I call myself Plant Medicine Queen. I'm the founder of WCI Health, your alternative health and wellness company. I personally help you to level up on your wellness journey using the healing powers of botanicals and education as tools so that you can live your best life right here and now, avoiding adverse reaction and also saving money on healthcare costs. And that is why our guest today is very, very uh, dear to my heart. She's a dear friend. And uh, join me in welcoming nurse practitioner, Julie Butter. Julie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Dr. O. You know how I feel about you and think about you, and I'm so grateful for your leadership. Oh, thank you so much, nurse Julie. So for those of our uh, audience, uh, did, uh, I know nurse Julie is one of the uh, folks that host uh, uh, the Clubhouse House with me on Clubhouse uh, uh, Cannabis Psychedelic Club. She is a uh, uh, valuable resources to our community. So for those of you that have not met her, I'm going to give her an opportunity to introduce herself. Julie, please tell us a little bit about yourself and how you find yourself in the cannabis space. Sure, sure. So um, I'm originally trained as a nurse midwife. And um, I, and as part of that training, I also received my master's in public health. And um, I caught babies for over 14 years Mm -hmm. um, at the teaching hospitals in Massachusetts. And um, then I started to have a tremor so I could no longer suture and had to move out of um, that space. And at that time, I moved into cannabis medicine and sort of at the same time, my dad was diagnosed with Parkinson's and my sister-in-law was diagnosed with MS. And it was kind of a constellation of um, situations that just was like, now's the time to move into this. Thank you so much. I mean, years and years of being a midwife, I tend to tell people, I say, oh, I am that uh, doctor, my own doctor, I deliver medicine and not babies. You guys are our hero. And uh, and uh, I mean, that is really, really awesome. So uh, you are a, a nurse practitioner, a cannabis practitioner. Mm-hmm. Tell us about uh, the how your patient, how they normally come to you? Do they get referred to you? How does that work? 
Um, that's a great question. And, and it's, it's various routes. Um, I'm, I'm practicing in Massachusetts. And mm-hmm. so in Massachusetts, we have both a, a medical program and an adult use program. And um, as a, in the medical program, I'm one of the providers who certify patients for their medical card. And I also do um, follow up and consulting um, on how people are using it, how to get the best results from it. Um, So that's mainly how I see patients is through the medical program in Massachusetts. Um, I also work um, with Radical Health, which is um, out of California. And um, I do cannabis consultations through that organization for people nationally and internationally just uh, just to have conversations about what they have available. It's not always um, all parts of the plant. Sometimes it's just CBD, but um, you know, we talk about the different, what's available, how to use it. Um, that's generally mainly what I do. That's awesome. That is really, really cool. So when it comes to a uh, payment system, do all, all your patients, do they uh, pay out of pocket? How does that even work? Because I know some of our audience, they will be wondering uh, if we want to go this route, will insurance, I mean, some states uh, is legal. Cannabis is legal, definitely in Massachusetts. That's why you practice there. Right. Does the state, since it's legal, do they help out in any way at all? So no. It's um, it's still federally illegal, and insurances are certainly um, through federal portals, and that's something that's really dear to my heart. And we're, I'm working um, with some groups on trying to find ways to lower the costs. To I I feel like that's a barrier. That's just another barrier to people's health and well being, and. Mm. Um, that's actually probably the hardest part of this work for me is that it, it is out of pocket for patients and um, that doesn't, that doesn't feel doesn't good. Go well. um, yeah. 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 So uh, um, what are the uh, type of uh, conditions that you normally see in your, in your practice, you know, like the common type? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I would say that pain and anxiety are probably the two most common, certainly anxiety this past year for the, pandemic, I think anxiety was ubiquitous. It was probably every mm-hmm. patient, whether whatever else they had, anxiety was an issue. Um, so this last year, that was probably the most prevalent. Before that, I would say pain is probably the was the most common. There's a lot of sleep disturbances, a lot of PTSD. Mm-hmm. Those are probably the most common, but, but it ranges from anything from like Parkinson's or any neurological um, so, so, yeah, to any physical symptoms, to even people wanting to use it for recovery from athletics and sports, to um, people trying to use it to shift their brain or to shut off their brain after a day or um, get some get some rest and recovery. That's awesome. That's awesome. I know uh, uh, for a patient that you see, what are their success rates? Uh, I mean, do they uh, when they come back, uh, how, when you compare what they are doing with cannabis and to their traditional pharmaceuticals, what are the, uh, the testimonial that we are hearing from this patient? It's unbelievable, Dr. O. I mean, you know, I've worked with regular pharmaceuticals for my whole career before this. And you you had people who were sort of mildly a little bit better, but always, you know, always with side effects, always, you know, working around the edges sort of of just trying to tinker and keep it safe and keep it, keep it something that somebody would get a benefit from. And I hear on the regular weekly you know, personally, you know, I don't believe that cannabis is magic. I don't feel like it's a miracle. It's Mm -hmm. a botanical medicine. We are learning how to use it. I think that for some people, it can be such a game changer that it feels like magic or it feels like a miracle. But Mm -hmm. generally speaking, it's, it's the safest it's the safest medicine I've ever worked with. The amount of benefit to side effect 
profile that people have make it really highly conducive to to their life, to not getting in the way of their life. Um, I, w- weekly, I get people telling me that this changed their life. That is awesome. It is not magic. Cannabis is medicine. It's botanical. I mean, uh, and uh, from uh, your experience, how do we uh, how do we tackle the stigma that is still surrounding this plant? I mean, professionals, uh, healthcare professionals like you, especially somebody like you that have worked on both sides of the aisle, how, how do you help give us a, a tip on how we can navigate the stigma that is still surrounding this plant? Especially we have some pharmaceuticals now, epidurals and all and sativas, Right. Why, uh, Nos, uh, Nos Julie, do we still have this plant on Schedule 1? You know, in, in my experience, what seems to be the greatest stigma buster for, for people is when they have somebody in their life or somebody that they love or care about who hasn't gotten relief from anything, and then they use cannabis and they get relief. That seems to be in my experience, sort of the biggest stigma buster because people, once it's somebody they know, someone they love, someone they trust, who they've seen suffer and they've seen try so many different options and and then their last resort is cannabis, which should be their first resort because of its safety profile. They finally get to cannabis. They have some relief. That seems to really be when people, when people close to them or people who are doubting about it start to change their perspective and say, um, wow, okay. So yeah. I, I, I really feel like it's almost this person to person that is gonna slowly, like it's a slow process. And and the, the reefer madness campaign was, mm-hmm. if we could figure out how to harness that power of that message, um, we could move more quickly. But short of that, it seems to be about, you know, certainly educating um, new nurses, new pharmacists, new doctors in the field when they're still sort of fresh out seems to be a really another option and something that um, the, the American Cannabis Nurse Association is working towards to really making sure that new providers know about these options before they get hooked in with all of the other stuff but it it's it's a bear it's a beast this stigma and i see it every day and um it's our it's our number one fight right now yeah it's a slog i call it a slog and (laughs) yeah and one thing that i'm so so appreciative especially when it comes to our nurse practitioners is that you guys are like at the forefront of this old uh i call it battle because there's so many, uh, I mean, as a clinical pharmacist, some of my colleagues, they think I'm kind of crazy to even be dabbling into this space, but you, uh, the nurses are like right there. And I really want to say uh, thank you to you guys so much for what you are doing. Education is going to be the key. So that's a part of the patient and family members one-on-one. What about the lawmakers? Because from uh, back in the days, according to the history that we read was that this plant was used for almost everything under the sun. Can you talk on the politics behind this whole prohibition and what, uh, what do you think the future is? Um, it is a, it is a slog, it's a slog. I think it's all, I think you know what made, what took it out of our pharmacopoeia. It, it was the third most common um, pharmaceutical in our pharmacopoeia before it was removed at at the protest of the AMA, um, who were using it regularly for everything from dysmenorrhea and painful periods to migraines to you know Eli Lilly, Pfizer. They all had cannabis tinctures. And um, everybody used them readily until essentially it was racism and classism and 
all of the stuff it's, it's, that's still at play today that um that took it away from us and um you know one of the one of the leading minds in cannabis medicine um, is a neurologist named Ethan Russo. And he has a, in 2001, he coined a term called clinical endocannabinoid deficiency, which he, and, and since then he's written more papers on it and there's more and more um, data supporting it, but that basically uh, a decreased endocannabinoid tone and often because it's been taken out of, it used to be in our soil, it used to be in our water, our farm animals used to eat it, cannabinoids were regularly available, and that there's some ideas that with the decrease of cannabinoids available to people, largely in hemp and as well as in, in other parts of cannabis, that um, that decrease has weakened our autoimmune system and weakened our endocannabinoid system and decreased our endocannabinoid tone. And our own body make the cannabinoids called endocannabinoids that look just like the cannabinoids from the plant, which are phytocannabinoids. And that just that humans having less of them available to balance our endocannabinoid system has led to the increase of things like fibromyalgia, migraines, um, endometriosis, irritable bowel syndrome, all of these things. And so um, we are... We are learning so much daily. This is this is a boom of science, and um, we all need to get on board. Thank you so much for all that golden nugget that you just dropped, us, uh, Julie. And that is really, I mean, I, I what I pick out there. You said there is kind of the deficiency in the endocannabinoid itself. What do you think to the? What do you say to this uh, kind of thought that okay, if it's a deficiency. Can't we like supplement it? You know, like we do our vitamins over the counter. What is your take on that? So it looks like we can, um, you know, obviously data and research has been hampered and restricted because it's because of the federal government, because it's federally illegal. But we do see research from Canada, from Israel, and even preclinical studies that in fact, we can supplement our endocannabinoid system with phytocannabinoids that we get from the plant. And um, we can balance, reach, our, the, the main role of the endocannabinoid system is to reach homeostasis, to balance our different parts of our, of our body to come into balance. So, and we're able to use cannabinoids from the plant to, to bump up our own system that might be deficient. Yeah, I mean, that would really make sense. Uh, I mean, it will really, <laughs> I mean, it will make sense because sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm wondering how did our ancestor, how did they even deal with the toys of daily life? How, back in the days, what did they do when we did not have pharmaceuticals? How did they survive? So you... Know you Go ahead. Go no, ahead. I was going to say, I, I, I've just been doing some research for this talk that I'm going to give. And like, there's this, um, this thing, I'm trying to think this medication, I'm, I'm trying to think who, I think it was Eli Lilly, who was a producer, and it was called dysmenia. And it not only had cannabinoids in it, but it also had something called capsaicin in it, which, which essentially target the trip V1 vanilloid receptors, which is not exactly the endocannabinoid system, but it's part of the endocannabinoid system. And like, how did we know that back then? You know, it's just amazing how there's all of these other systems that are involved in our endocannabinoid system that people have been using forever. And, and, and also that there's been um, data uncovered or sources uncovered that literally from the beginning of time in every continent since word was written down even on stone tablets that people have been using cannabis for um in in the what i've been looking at it for has been sort of um in all some sort of women's reproductive health um but in in everything like they they found um mummies in egypt who were had who were had issues in childbirth who had cannabis oil in in their in their umbilicus or in their belly button it's been everywhere throughout time. 
That is so cool. Oh my goodness. Even the mommies are using yeah. this stuff, <laughs> folks. Man, are you kidding me right now? No, really. Mommies are using it. If it's good for mommies, it's good <laughs> for the queen because I've heard they said the queen victorious of England. That's right. Even you this product are you kidding me right now we got the coins using it hell to the coin we got mommies somebody needs to sign me up for that no that's exactly right and actually in i think it was like 1863 there was a letter to the to a a, a body a, a clinical body in london where a doctor had said that he had been using it for over a hundred patients and they had all had such good results with with lack of side effects and he said i call for a study of this medicine and that was 1803 i mean that is so we so uh, jesus help yep. us here anyway I guess we have to continue uh, to advocate for this uh, plant because like you said, Nurse Julie, so many of our clients need this, this medicine. Talking about advocacy, I know that's another area that is near and dear to your heart. You are a social justice advocate. Talk to us about what you think is going on. I, I know you are not, uh, a farmer or, or, or cultivators, but when you look at the uh, all the rules that is coming out uh, about cultivation, how folks cannot even plant their own, all these kind of loopholes that they are trying to come in, what do you say to to those aspects? Do you think uh, patients should be able to uh, cultivate at least something to use for their own well-being. Just like we, we, we cultivate uh, uh, tomatoes and spinach and all this stuff. What's your say, take of, on of that? Of course. I mean, so many, so many, in Massachusetts, it is legal to, um, to grow your own. And the amount of um, the therapeutic value of people growing their own medicine and, and harvesting it and using it is exponential. And um, it is a social justice issue. People, it's a plant. And um, any states that start to enact cannabis legislation that are not incorporating the ability and the freedom for people to grow their own medicine, I think are really backwards and huge, huge amount of um, moral issues, honestly. I, I, it's, it makes me crazy. I know, I know, especially when you look at uh, the cost of healthcare. I mean, I, I work uh, uh, with a prior authorization, you know, like when you go yeah. to the doctor, they, you know that you guys are the ones sending those prior authorizations to folks like me to review. It breaks my heart when I have to say no to somebody that have cancer or one of these chronic condition, and you say no to their medicine. And at the same time, we have cannabis that has been shown studies upon study. We know we need more studies that this plant is relatively safe com compared to some of the alternatives that we have, but we still, uh, patients are still not able to get access to it. That's right. It's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of really crazy. Coming to, uh, with uh, me staying on that topic of um, justice, social justice, especially with uh, this current incident that happened with uh, uh, Kerry, uh, Shakaria Richardson, and the, I call it Shakaria V, uh, Olympics uh, Association or Olympics Federation. What is your take on what is going on there? It's like, uh, like in my household, my husband is on one side, I'm on one side. What side are you? And tell us what are organization doing out there to correct whatever injustice or whatever needs to be corrected? Is, is it as a result of, do we need to do more education to train our young ones. Tell me a little bit ab uh, about that incident. What do you think? You know, I, I, yeah, I have a lot of, I have a lot of thoughts about it. They're, they're all in support of her and her humanity and her being as a human being. 
being able to use plant medicine, you know, I think the rules have to change. I think it's people have to decide is the people who are in power, are you saying it's a performance enhancer, but it makes people lazy? Like, what are you saying here? What, you're, you're that is a golden of, gem you just dropped right there. Out of both sides of your, right? Like you're saying, oh, this is, this is bad. This is harmful. And then this is a, this is a, this gives people unfair advantage. It can't be both. It can't be both. And, um, you know, I think that the, the time is right. I think that this, I think she's a hero. I think she's a queen. And if she wants it, she will be able to take this very, very far. And I think there are so many people behind her and this is the moment. And I think it's going to galvanize a lot of change. I think especially the professional organizations, there's the Cannabis Nurses of Color organization, there's ACAM, there, which are organizations that are so incredibly socially conscious and doing beautiful work. And I think that um, they're in the lead right now. And it's just for us to listen and follow and raise raise the voices of people who are involved. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And people like you are in the forefront of advocacy and social justice. I'm really, really appreciative of that. I grew up with herbal medicine. Right. A lot of our pharmaceutics are derived from plants. So we, like we said earlier, we have pharmaceutics right now that is fashioned towards the cannabis and other botanicals. It's like we are two year old, we wanna eat our cake and also have it at the same time. Who, who does that? I guess we, we I'm, I just, I'm just grateful that uh, you people like you are out there uh, making your voice heard and, uh, uh, and doing this amazing work that you do in spite of right all back at you do. dr Al. yes ma'am right back so, at you. yeah what do you think the future holds for not just cannabis as a medicine do we are we gonna get to a place where we can come out and say this is medicine and it will be a i mean accepted worldwide not just for cannabis even even uh, pharmaceutical traditional um, plants, other plants like the psychedelics. I mean, we are beginning to see movement studies on that. What is your take? How do? What is the future of plants as medicine? You know, in some ways, I almost feel like um, psychedelics are might leapfrog cannabis, just because, especially the psych, some of the psychedelics, some of the plant medicine, some of the not necessarily plant medicines, but the MDMA, but certainly plant medicine with psilocybin, that they're they're in phase three clinical trials. So that's because of MAPS. And we are not close to that yet with cannabis. I mean, it's broader mm -hmm. where, because it's happening everywhere and people have been using it forever and people have been using psychedelics forever, of course, as well, but I think where we are with the clinical studies and the way that medicine moves in this country, the way that you need clinical data and then you need, you know, robust clinical data and then you need years of trials after that for it to really get into. Mm -hmm. We know that the clinical practice take, can be decades after there's new evidence of what's more effective. And so it seems that psychedelics or certain psychedelics are going to be available in the pharmacopoeia or certainly certainly more readily available before cannabis because can because they can put a certain number of milligrams or micrograms or anything into a capsule and it's more standardized where cannabis there's every single person with their own endocannabinoid system and then there's inhalation edibles topicals from up to down and to have a uh, to have a, a standardized formulization that is the right dose at the right time for each individual is going to is is much more elusive than for um, psychedelics so i think it's going to we're actually 
I think psychedelics are coming first. Yeah, I kind of agree with you, especially when we look at the fact that some of the uh, our antidepressant, our antipsychotic medication were kind of fashioned uh, towards the psychedelic pathway anyway. That is really, I mean, it's, uh, it's unfortunate for, for cannabis, but at the same time, when you also look at the fact that some of the uh, diseases that we use, the, we might need to use the psychedelic compound for, we hardly even have an effective medicine for them right now. That is pretty cool. Thank you so much for dropping that for us. What is your advice to some of our listeners that are new to, uh, maybe they are contemplating uh, adding cannabis or plant medicine to their wellness regimen? What would be your advice to these folks? Um, so I guess it sort of depends on, unfortunately, on where they live and what's available to them. You know, I certainly don't want to... Um, at least publicly encourage anybody mm -hmm. to operate Definitely. outside of the mm -hmm. law and get themselves in any sort of situation that mm -hmm. further compromises anybody. So, mm -hmm. so there's that piece of it. Um, mm -hmm. And hopefully that will be going away over time. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I guess it would sort of depend on where I'm talking to the person from, like what they have, what they ha safely have access to and what they have access to that they know has been, is a, is a clean product has been tested and they know they're not going to get, um, you know, pesticides, heavy metals, that sort of thing, because, you know, first we want to do no harm. Okay. That's absolutely correct. Definitely. And that's why we normally say do not start or stop any right. medicine without talking to your doctor. And okay. even though earlier we were talking about uh, Shikari uh, Richardson, yeah, we have all this uh, stuff going on. I, I, I mean, banning somebody for plant medicine, but at the end of the day, our young ones too, you need to understand when they still have the rules and regulation and laws, let us obey those laws. Let us not break break the law. Law is law. We just that's part of what we are. We are. We have to be responsible. Life we, is we, not we, as activists, though. We have to work to change those unfair laws. Definitely, yeah. definitely. And while we are working at it, let your just, just uh, um, um, Congressman Lewis says, "Good trouble." That's that right. is what we're going to keep doing. Good trouble is That's what right. we want That's out exactly there. Right. That, is, uh, right that is amazing. Nurse, uh, Nurse Julie, please tell us where can our, uh, our audience find you, especially those of our audience that are listening to us from out of Massachusetts, Boston area that might want to uh, come to you for, for you to be one of your uh, clinicians, how can folks enroll with you, those that are in Boston area, then our audience that are not in your jurisdiction, how can we follow you? Give us a little bit of how we can connect with you. Um, so in Massachusetts, I work for a nonprofit organization called Green Network Providers. And um, we are happy to, we mostly, we do certifications. We're also happy to educate you know, and have consultations with people. And then I also have the honor of working with um, Eloise Thiessen and Caitlin Bernhard through Radical Health, which is out in California. And both of those women, those nurse practitioners are amazing resources as well. So yeah, any of us would be happy to talk to anybody. And we're always happy to you know, have informational sessions if people have just some questions and if people really want to consult, that's, of course, we're happy to do that too. That is so, so cool. That is why I cannot wait to uh, to bring you back on the show. But before I let you go, what is your social media handles? Where can we connect with you on social? We don't want to just uh, bring you in here because you are a well of knowledge. And I mean, Folks like you are very rare in our community, in, in, in our space right now, to have a clinician that's actually seeing patients. That's huge. 
I'm an educator, I don't see patients. So I always kind of have extra respect for people like you. So where can our audience, uh, what is your social handles? Um, it's most of it is just with my first and last name, which is Julie Battle. It's J U L I E B A T T E L. That's usually my. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not very great at that stuff. <laughs> you it's guys not, need to go and follow nurse practitioner Julie Battle uh, on social. She's on LinkedIn. She's on uh, IG. She's on Twitter. That's where you want to connect with her. Having said that, thank you so much, Julie, for being here today. I'm looking forward to years of us uh, partnering together. We're definitely going to bring you back for sure. Okay, folks, that's our show for today. Uh, for those of you that are yet to sign up for Healthy Cost Well membership, you need to sign up for that membership. Every week, I record a short 10 minute video on how you can level up on your wellness journey using the powers of botanical, not just botanical, we also talk about pharmaceutics and other things, tricks and tips that we can use to level up on our journey. And also for those of you that are still on the side, please, if you are there, join our teams, and if you are an organization and you would like to sponsor this show, slide in my DM, WCI Health 19, or head straight to our website, wci-health.com. Until next time, folks, remember health equals well. Bye, guys. Bye, Nurse Julie. Thank Bye, you so Dr. much. Bye, Dr. I love you. Thank you. Love you back. Love you back. Bye.